Welcome everyone to Classic Harbor Line. Today we're going to do a very fun tour on the Manhattan 2. Uh, this is a 1920 style yacht. They're doing the safety briefing right now. I'm Ariel and I run the show called Urbanist Exploring Cities and today I'm going to take you on the journey along the New York waterfront. We're going to go down Staten Island, Bayonne and see the industrial and military history of the city. And our tour guide today is Andrew Gustafson, who's been exploring the history of New York for more than 10 years. So he's a veteran in terms of exploring the city and all of its interesting nooks and crannies. Welcome aboard, everybody. So my name is Andrew Gustafson. Uh, I'm gonna be your tour guide today. Um, and welcome aboard this beautiful boat in the Classic Harbor Line on this special tour um, that we are doing in celebration of, today is the last day of Fleet Week. So Fleet Week is an annual celebration that's been going on for many decades over the years, uh, but it's really a time when we can uh, celebrate our service members and give civilians the opportunity um, to meet service members and, and learn about what they do uh, in the sea services. So. Um, so we're coming past the Chelsea Piers here on our left hand side. You can also see on the left uh, Pier 57, this metallic mint green pier right here. Also part of the Chelsea Piers complex. This was built by the Grace Line in the 1950s. Um, the Grace Line operated both passenger and freight service uh, largely in, the, uh, in South America. Um, and so this is their main pier here. When it was built, it was called the Super Pier uh, because it was so large. Uh, and actually, uh, it's floating. So underneath it, there are these big concrete boxes that float uh, just above the surface of the Hudson River, and that's what holds up the pier. It's a bit of an engineering marvel. If you look to the right-hand side, um, you can see that brown clock tower. It almost looks like it's made out of chocolate. Uh, you, and it says Erie Lackawanna on it. That is the Erie Lackawanna train terminal. And we can't talk about the military history of the harbor without talking about how you got troops and supplies into the city. Because this river we're in right now, the Hudson, is a, was a major barrier and still is in some ways today. If you took a train journey into New York prior to 1908, there was no crossing of the Hudson River. And so you can see this terminal was built with those ferry slips right there. Um, today we do have passenger train tunnels that go underneath the river. We have uh, the Amtrak, the New Jersey Transit, the PATH train tunnels. Um, many people still commute across the river by, by ferry, um, but uh, when this was built in 1907, that was the only way that you could get uh, across um, the river. And so for, say, troops coming into uh, New York during World War I and World War II, um, many of them had to take a ferry. So they would come into these train terminals on New Jersey side if they were coming from encampments or supply depots west of the Hudson River. Um, they would have to take a ferry to transfer them over to the piers and the warehouses in New Jersey, uh, in uh, Manhattan, uh, or over in Brooklyn. Of course, if you want to cross the Hudson River today, you can take the train or you can take your car, which you do right here. So if you look to your left, you can see that tower, uh, that brick tower with the vents on the front of it. Uh, this is one of the ventilation shafts for the Holland Tunnel built in 1927. It was the first vehicle uh, crossing of the Hudson River in New York City. And so you can see there are actually two towers on the Manhattan side and two towers on the New Jersey side. But now we're approaching the Intrepid. USS Intrepid is going to be coming up on our right-hand side in just a moment. It was launched in 1943. It's what's called an Essex-class aircraft carrier. Um, there are 22 of these types of aircraft carriers built during World War II. And they proved not only incredibly effective during the war, but also incredibly adaptable and resilient after the war. Um, now to our left, um, we're coming past Battery Park City. Um, and we can see behind that the tallest building not only in New York, um, but also in the Western Hemisphere. Interesting fact about One World Trade Center uh, is that it, its uh, height is 1,776 feet. So it's a historic height of 1776. Um, that height includes the spire. Um, there's actually an international committee uh, that determines how tall, really tall buildings really are. 
Uh, and so they determined that that stair is not a mechanical feature. Uh, it is an integral part of the architecture of the building. So that does make it the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere, regardless of what anyone from Chicago may say otherwise. So, uh, but down into the right, you, you can see that there's a gap in there. That's where two World Trade Center may be built. Uh, then we have three World Trade Center that has those diagonal uh, braces in there, and then four World Trade Center, and then five, six, and seven as part of the rebuilt complex. Right in that neck of Manhattan, though, um, you can find a very, very important building uh, when we talk about the World War II history of New York. And I can just see the corner of it. You have to know what to look for. But it's this beautiful Art Deco building uh, at 90 Church Street. So if you've ever gone to the post office in Lower Manhattan, that's where the post office is. And during World War II, it was a post office, but it was also the home of something called the Eastern Frontier. And so this is where they managed all of the uh, convoy operations during World War II. So it was this massive nerve center uh, for directing uh, the convoy ships, carrying troops and supplies, but also all of the escort ships uh, going across the uh, Atlantic. So a lot of activity uh, in, uh, uh, in New York City during World War II, and arguably, uh, you know, this was the most important and the busiest port uh, in the world uh, during the Second World War. Hello, everyone. Right now, we are at Classic Harbor Line, enjoying the views of the New York Harbor. This is a military history tour with Andrew Gustafson of Turnstile Tours. Um, he's had more than 10 years of experience all around New York City, going deep into the history, so it's awesome to learn more about New York City. So, Classic Harbor Line has a series of tours all around New York City, the New York Harbor. So right now we are facing the New York Harbor. We're seeing the tip of Manhattan. And over there we're seeing Brooklyn as well. All right, so we can see Ellis Island to our right-hand side here. Um, you can see the main building with those four towers and those copper domes on top. Um, Ellis Island, uh, of course, was the immigration station for New York between 1892 and 1954. It's estimated that about 12 million people passed through Ellis Island. Um, the vast majority of those passed through before 1924, uh, when major immigration restrictions were put in place. So now we can see the Statue of Liberty here to our right. A little bit of history about the statue. It was conceived in 1870, of course, as a gift from the people of France to the United States. You'll notice the statue is in three distinct parts. We have the statue itself, the green part, uh, which is the gift from France that was fabricated in France. We have the pedestal. That was the responsibility of the American committee to raise money for the pedestals. It was all private money. The federal government's contribution to the Statue of Liberty was the base. And that's actually the oldest part of the statue. It actually dates all the way back to 1811. And so that's called Fort Wood. Fort Wood was a coastal defense fort. Um, this was all part of the um, a system of fortifications that were built in preparation for the War of 1812. Um, and so uh, basically this was an obsolete fort in the 1870s and 1880s when they were developing the Statue of Liberty. So um, the federal government gave it up and they built the statue on top of it. Wherever you find an entrance to New York Harbor, you're going to find a fort on either side of that entrance. Um, some of them, the oldest ones are from about 1811. Um, you'll find ones that were built in the 1880s, 1890s, and some that were even uh, refurbished uh, in World War II. Uh, but every, every time you enter the harbor, you're going to find these pair of forts. I am loving the weather today. It's absolutely beautiful. And it's a great way to see New York City sometimes when you're in the city, you don't really appreciate uh, all the other aspects that grew New York City, such as uh, trade and commerce via the water, and then also our military history with defense. The part of New York's greatness as a city is that it's one of the best naturally protected natural harbors in the entire world. And it led to New York becoming such a powerhouse throughout American history. The first com successful commercial shipment of containerized cargo took place on April 26, 1956. 
It was a ship called the Ideal X, and it uh, shipped, it shipped out from Newark, New Jersey uh, to Houston, Texas. And this was the idea of a guy named Malcolm McLean, which he said, what if we had uh, one standardized box that we could put on a ship and put on a truck and put on a train? That original shipment carried 53 containers. Today, we routinely get ships here in New York Harbor carrying 15,000 containers. Uh, but it's really, you know, I would argue it's the most important invention of the 20th century. Um, this, as you'll maybe be able to tell, this is an artificial peninsula. So this was built in the 1970s um, as containerization was growing in popularity. Um, and so they built this massive artificial peninsula so they could have a open space uh, and a lot of docking space in deep water. Um, for these large container ships. Um, and so Bayonne, actually for a long time, this is where all the biggest container ships came here um, because previously, up until a couple of years ago, the really big container ships could not get around Bayonne and up into Newark, Newark Bay uh, because the Bayonne Bridge was too low. Uh, they raised the Bayonne Bridge a couple of years ago, 65 feet, in order to accommodate larger container ships. And that was caused by larger container ships being built because they expanded the Panama Canal. So actually, ships around the world, but especially here in the Western Hemisphere, are built to a specific standard that's called Panamax. And so that is the maximum size of ship that can fit through the Panama Canal. When they expanded the Panama Canal a few years ago, that meant there was a new Panamax standard and so we had bigger ships, and that meant every port in the Western Hemisphere, if they wanted to accommodate these new ships, had to deepen their channels, they had to raise their bridges, they had to install larger cranes that could fit over top of the ships. So the Panama Canal has a huge uh, impact on shipping infrastructure all around the world and the shipbuilding industry all around the world as well. So we're coming inside what's called Robin's Reef. So that's the Robin's Reef Lighthouse. It's still an active lighthouse. Um, although today, almost all of the lighthouses in America um, are automated, they're managed by the Coast Guard, um, but they do not have lighthouses. Robin's Reef is probably most famous for one of its tenders, a woman named Catherine Walker, who was the first female lighthouse tender in America. Uh, being a lighthouse tender actually used to be a presidential appointment. Uh, and so her husband received that appointment and then he died. And so she operated it uh, for the rest of her life um, she lived there, raised all of her kids on Robins, and rode them every day to school on Staten Island in a rowboat, back and forth. Um, she's also credited with rescuing about 100 sailors over her career in her little rowboat, um, sailors that got into trouble out here on Robins Reef. Um, also, uh, Catherine Walker is significant. She has a buoy tender here in New York Harbor named for her. Not that one, uh, but another one. Um, and. She also is going to have a monument uh, of her installed in, in St. George in Staten Island. A couple of years ago, you may recall that uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio um, launched an initiative to get more statues of women in the city, because there are almost none. Um, and uh, so Catherine Walker was one of the people who was selected to have a uh, statue made of her. Um, another thing about this, this channel here to our, to our right underneath the Verrazano Bridge, of course during World War II there was no Verrazano Bridge. This was built in 1964. But there was a barrier that was there uh, in World War II. Uh, actually in January of 1942, uh, they installed the submarine net that stretched from Staten Island over to Coney Island. And so any ships coming in and out of the harbor, they actually had to open that net so they could pass through it. Just a couple of days after the net was installed, the first German submarine arrived off the shores of New York. So when Germany declared war on the United States on December 12, 1941, uh, one of their first offensive operations against the US was to send five U-boats to attack American coastal shipping. So each U-boat was given a sector, so there was just one U-boat per sector along the eastern seaboard. The one assigned to this sector was called U-123. And so they arrived here in early January. Um, 
just to give you an indication of how hastily this operation was planned, the commander of U-123 was given a uh, nautical chart of New York Harbor from 1876, and he was given a map from the New York World's Fair. That's what he was given to navigate the waters here. But he was smart enough to know not to enter the harbor because he didn't know that the net was there, but even if it wasn't there, it's very easy to get trapped in here. Um, so they smartly just sat right outside the harbor and in very short order they sank three ships within our coastal waters right here. And so that really brought the war home um, for New Yorkers. That submarine got so close actually that they could see um, cars driving past at Breezy Point in Queens. And the other thing that they saw was the lights of Coney Island. And in fact, they were shocked to see all the lights on in New York. And when you think about World War II, you know, you may have heard about blackouts or maybe seen them in cartoons. And they are always for air raid warnings, right? The main reason why we did blackouts in coastal cities was to protect coastal shipping. Because at night, when the ships come out of the harbor, the bright lights in the city silhouette those ships against the background. And it took us about four months to actually turn out the lights in coastal communities. And during that period of time, in the first half of 1942, German submarines sank 400 vessels in New York, in, uh, in American East Coast waters. Um, so you could routinely go down to the beach and see ships burning off the shore. And actually, if you go to the New York Aquarium in Coney Island, they have an amazing exhibit uh, that's all about the shipwrecks uh, in the New York Bight the area just outside the harbor. And then if you look down into the left of that white crane, you can see the white superstructure and the black mast of a ship. That is a Coast Guard cutter sitting in dry dock number one. You can see the door of the dry dock. It's a, a light blue color, and then there's a yellow fence along the top of it. So that's the door that's holding back the water of the East River. That basin is dry right now. Uh, Dry Dock 1 was built in 1851. Um, what's being repaired in there right now, speaking of Fleet Week, is a uh, Coast Guard cutter. Uh, that's the US Coast Guard cutter uh, Diligence. Um, and amazingly, when that ship was commissioned, the Navy Yard was still open. That ship was built in 1964, and it's still in active service. As they say, the Coast Guard does more with less than any other branch of the military. The Coast Guard is smaller than the NYPD. It only has about 29,000 uniform members. Um, but they have to patrol all of the coastal waters of the United States, many of our interior waters as well. Down into the right, you, you can see that there's a gap in there. That's where two World Trade Center may be built. Uh, then we have three World Trade Center that has those diagonal uh, braces in there, and then four World Trade Center, and then five, six, and seven as part of the rebuilt complex. Right in that neck of Manhattan, though, um, you can find a very, very important building uh, when we talk about the World War II history of New York. And I can just see the corner of it. You have to know what to look for. But it's this beautiful Art Deco building uh, at 90 Church Street. So if you've ever gone to the post office in Lower Manhattan, that's where the post office is. And during World War II, it was a post office, but it was also the home of something called the Eastern Frontier. And so this is where they managed all of the uh, convoy operations during World War II. So it was this massive nerve center uh, for directing uh, the convoy ships, carrying troops and supplies, but also all of the escort ships uh, going across the uh, Atlantic. So a lot of activity uh, in uh, uh, in New York City during World War II, and arguably, uh, you know, this was the most important and the busiest port uh, in the world um, during the Second World War. Good. Yeah. I thought I'd just say hello to everybody. Yeah. There. Um, and, uh, do you enjoy working in the Brooklyn Navy Yard? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's uh, so much history there, but I really love the community of uh, people in the yard. So we've gotten to know. You know, so many of the other tenants and the folks that work at the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation mm -hmm. are great partners and friends. Um, and it's just like an interesting place to work every day. There's always something new happening and changing. So, um, yeah, I love it. Exactly. Yeah. And are there any um, remains of the Revolutionary War history? No. Um, so, because that was Wallabout Bay. Yeah, so Wallabout Bay was the site of the um, prison ships. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
from about 18, or excuse me, 1778 to 1783, um, the Walnut Bay was used for staging prison ships for American prisoners of war. Um, about 11,500 people died on board those prison ships, which is um, more Americans than died in all the battles of the Revolutionary War put together. Oh, wow. Um, now, those remains began to wash up on the shores of the Wallabout Bay, mm. um, and so they were collected by local people. Um, and just outside the gates of the Navy Yard, there was a monument erected in 1808, um, the prison ship Martyrs Memorial. That was then moved to Fort Greene Park, which is where it is today. Um, and so the current monument is there, uh, was built in 1908, yeah. um, and that's the largest uh, monument to the Revolutionary War in the United States. Um, but it does have a crypt underneath it, um, and there are 13 tombs to represent the 13 colonies. Um, but yeah, so that's the main Revolutionary War, you know, adjacent site. Within the Navy Yard, though, no, I mean, there's been so much construction and fill done over the last 220 years. Right. Uh, you know, but over the course of that history, they definitely uncovered, you know, remains and other artifacts um, from the Revolutionary War. There's just no longer any extant on site. Right now, we are looking at the beautiful tip of Manhattan downtown. We see the Freedom Tower. Well, Freedom Tower is a colloquial name because the official name is One World Trade Center. However, us New Yorkers, we tend to call it the Freedom Tower. It just stuck. Right here, we have the Brooklyn Bridge, built in 1883. This is where New York City grew post-colonization uh, of the Dutch, starting with New Amsterdam. And right here, we have some of the oldest parts of New York City, which is the South Street Seaport that will take you back to old New York between the Revolutionary War to about the 18, mid-1800s. Very fascinating place to visit and walk around. Pier 17 is now a completely new, redone uh, pier. Full of uh, restaurants. There's a rooftop bar and venue up there. The Merchant Marine suffered the highest rate of casualty of any branch of the armed forces in World War II. There was a larger proportion of merchant mariners killed than uh, the U.S. Army, the Navy, the Army Air Corps, the Coast Guard, or the Marine Corps. Now, when you were in the Merchant Marine, uh, you were exempt from the draft. However, it was different than the other armed forces because you were only exempt from the draft when you were on a ship. If you were off a ship for more than 30 days, you could be drafted. Now, many sailors wound up off a ship for more than 30 days because their ship was sunk from underneath them. As soon as they hit the water, the clock started. Many of them wound up in POW camps. And what happened to them when they got back here, uh, got back to the US? Uh, they had missed their draft notices and they were arrested and thrown in jail for being draft dodgers. One of the most uh, notorious and scurrilous liars about uh, the Merchant Mariners uh, was a gossip columnist and uh, radio host named Walter Winchell, uh, who claimed that people only joined the Merchant Marine to get out of fighting. Many people joined the Merchant Marine because they couldn't join the armed forces. They had disqualifying injuries or illnesses, but they wanted contribution uh, in other ways, and so they joined the Merchant Marine. Um, so they're really the unsung heroes of, of World War II. Um, again, they are combat veterans. They were in combat zones. They were not considered veterans of World War II until 1987. And they still have not received the full measure uh, of their benefits for their contribution to the war. So we're very lucky that we have this beautiful statue here. Uh, but for the few merchant mariners that are still alive today, um, they still owe, we still owe them a set of um, gratitude. Um, historically, the Brooklyn Navy Yard did build a fair number of ships, but its primary role was repair. Um, and that was certainly the case during World War II uh, as well. Um, at its peak of operations in World War II, it employed over 70,000 people. It had five annexes across Brooklyn, Queens, and Bayonne. Uh, and in a four-year period of World War II, it repaired more than 5,000 vessels. 
Um, and so it got the nickname as the can-do yard. It was known as a yard that um, could repair ships that were uh, considered too far gone uh, because they had such a skilled um, shipbuilding workforce here. Um, but they also built a number of very, very significant ships that were built actually right about here, where we're going to pull up here. Just past this power station on the right, you're going to see um, a concrete structure with these domes on it. Um, this is now a wastewater treatment plant, but what used to be here was the uh, launch ways. So this was a, basically a big ramp where they launched ships from. Uh, in 1915, right on this spot, they launched a ship called the USS Arizona. That ship was, of course, sunk at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, with the loss of 1,177 sailors aboard. Almost half of all of the American service members killed in the attack on Pearl Harbor or on board this one ship. On this same spot, in January 1944, we launched the USS Missouri. And on September 2, 1945, that ship becomes the site of the signing of the instrument of surrender in Tokyo Bay, bringing an end to World War II. So the two ships that really formed the bookend of World War II, at least for the United States, were built right here on this spot in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And uh, it's a piece of our history that, that we're very, very proud of. Uh, I'm Ariel. This is, uh, I run the show Urbanist Exploring Cities. This is Classic Harbor Line. And always keep on exploring. Stay curious, my friends. Have a great day. Everyone, bye-bye. <laughs>